traits of a true scientist, always curious, contagiously enthusiastic, and forever eager to learn about anything and everything around him. He's equally at home hiking for hours across the Arizona desert where he once resided, or now the mountainous terrain of Southern California. He's even explored the deserts of Mars by way of piloting the pioneering robot opportunity a decade ago. Currently, he's part of a team digging into the planet's interior. How do I know all this? Well, I've known him and considered him a very close friend since he was at the ripe old age of 16. And that now stands, uh, are you ready for this, Jim? I'm not sure. More than <laughs> four decades. <laughs> a long time. Yeah, there's been a little change on the upper part of the upper part of the body for both of us here. Yep. You look the same. I no, mean. no, not quite. <laughs> One day in 1979, while James was at City High School and in search of a required semester public service project, he walked into my office at the Chaffee Planetarium and asked if he could do that project as an intern in the planetarium. And that was the start of a internship program that I am happy to say continues to this day. Nice. Planetarium Whiz Kids first include James as one of the most accomplished examples, but also some others in the program who have now engaged in highly successful careers throughout the US and beyond. Uh, think Jake Borgeli, Michelle Stark, and most recently Dan Tell. James was also active as a kid with some mighty enthusiastic contemporaries, and that's an understatement, in the student section of the GRAAA, where he held various leadership positions. When he moved into the adult group, he even served for a time as GRAAA president. So we have a former president with us. While attending Grand Valley from, I believe, 1982 through 87 or so, he continued to operate Veeam telescopes during the public nights and also to work part time as a producer and presenter at the Chaffee Planetarium. In other words, he continued, even as he does today, to share his contagious enthusiasm for astronomy and space and lots of other things that I could go into uh, continuously for others. James then went on to a master's degree specializing in geology at Michigan State University. He relocated to Phoenix in 2000 to take a job with a firm specializing in finding sources of water in the Arizona desert and related environmental issues. But he also remained active in his most important avocation and that of course was astronomy. He picked up right where he left off at GRAAA in Chaffee becoming a facilitator for a group called Sky Safari, which provides telescopes and speakers for various events conducted under the wonderful and reliably clear Arizona skies. With several of his GRAAA friends, he also moved to, uh, who also moved to Arizona while, we're, while in their 20s, uh, James formed a group called Minor Planet Research. The group searched for rogue asteroids using, among others, telescopes at the famous Lowell Observatory. During one of my several visits, the guys invited me up to Flagstaff during a, one of their observing runs, and that was a very memorable experience indeed. James eventually returned full-time to his love of research, obtaining a PhD from Arizona State University School of Earth and Space Exploration. And while there, he became a Martian geology scientist in this capacity, he worked with a number of top researchers and actually participated in navigating one of the first little Mars Explorer buggies, one called Opportunity, across the planet's surface in search of Martian meteorites. He holds postdoctoral research fellowships with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera, both at 
ASU and after relocating to California Institute of Technology and its Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. By then he had married a longtime friend from way back in his days at the museum and planetarium. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Mary Graff and has since started a family that includes two wonderful children. Rice, Rice, I think, Rice, Rice, Reese, Reese, Reese. Yeah. and Rose. I did that one better. And they reside in Montrose, California, which I assume is somewhere near Pasadena. He's also returned to specializing in the study of Mars via spacecraft, as our preview material indicates. This is only a fraction of the total bio, but we've got to give Jim some time here. It includes multiple research papers, a collaboration with top planetary scientists, and on and on and on. He's also participated in production of science documentaries for both the Discovery and History channels and other AV projects as well. So don't be surprised if his head pops up when you are watching one of those presentations. So it's time for my head to disappear and for him to pop up and take over this presentation. Join me in welcoming home longtime GRAAA friend and alumnus Dr. James Ashley, Science Plan Integrator at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. James. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to make sure. Um, wow, what an introduction. Thank you so much for that. And of course, you know how important you and the planetarium and the GRAAA have been in my life and then you know pretty much all the things you just listed um, uh, highly instrumental I, I remember my first trip to the Wien Observatory which took place in the fall of 1970 and I don't know if I ever told you that story I was six years old and my father knew somebody uh, I don't know the name of the person but he knew somebody who participated in the construction of the observatory and was aware of its existence. And uh, we made a pilgrimage one night uh, together to find the place. And I remember we got turned around a couple times on Buttrick. Um, and then we finally stopped at Gary Ross's house. Uh, and um, an old gentleman lived there at the time. And he had two dogs. He came to the door and we were asking where Kissing Rock Road was. We couldn't find it. And he pointed, of course, right to it. Um, and we found ourselves on, on the then dirt road leading up to the observatory. And Jim Marin answered the door. And I was six years old, and I just never forgot that experience. It was a, it was a, a meeting night, not a visitor's night. Um, so we weren't really supposed to be there. But Jim took the time to show us around anyway. And we went on a tour of the Wien Observatory and uh, that was 1970. <laughs> so uh, nine years before I met you. <clears throat> anyway, let us proceed. Um, I just wanted to say I missed the club. I missed the observatory. I missed the planetarium and I miss Michigan weather. You know, it's really boring here in California. We never have anything interesting happen here. It's just clear and sunny all the time. So uh, you have fires. <laughs> we have wildfires. Yes, we do have that. But let me get started. I want to jump into this because I have a feeling it's going to take a while. I'm going to share screens. And I will try to move through this swiftly. Can everyone see the screen as well as hear my voice? Yes. OK. So we're going to focus here on this, this mission, this lander. Um, we can talk about the Mars uh, 2020 Perseverance rover if we have some time, uh, because I did also work on that mission and am familiar with uh, some of the things that have happened. And I do have some footage for those who may not have seen it yet. 
Um, and it, even if you have, it certainly never gets old and we can watch it again, the landing footage of that mission. Um, but I'm gonna save that for the end if there's time, like I say, and I'm gonna step through my slide sequence here for the InSight mission, which is a lander, not a rover, and it's a geophysical mission. Um, you know, we're dating back to the desires of uh, the 1950s, really, the 57 in particular, the International Geophysical Year, when we wanted to study the Earth geophysics uh, across the globe. Um, it, it, what I mean is internationally uh, study the globe's geophysics uh, um, with a number of international partners on a number of levels. And that involves seismology, among a number of other things. And it was in the spirit of that uh, year, International Geophysical Year, that we then looked to Mars when we finally had the technology to do so and start thinking about its geophysics. But, you know, we're thinking of basic questions here, uh, and we'll get into those shortly. Um, but the timing of it is interesting because it originated in, in 1976 with the Viking mission. Let's, let's do that. Let's get involved here in the, in the slides. Um, there are fundamental questions associated with this, this line of thinking having to do with basic uh, planetary formation processes. In other words, as you see here, the question is, did all the rocky planets form from the same material? That's a basic question. We assume that they did, um, but we have to confirm that scientifically. And then the next question basically is, how did they change over the next five and a half billion years? Okay, so the, the image that we should keep in mind as we think about the InSight mission is something like this, a planetary accretion disk. And the idea that all the material here was probably homogenous. And we have some direct evidence in the form of primitive meteorite chemistry um, that confirms this assumption. Because when we look at that basic chemistry and compare it to the solar photosphere, we get a one-to-one -one correlation line with the exception of the, you know, the volatile elements, you know, the hydrogen and the helium. Uh, all, the, all the calcium, magnesium, oxygen, uh, carbon. When we look at the uh, relative abundances of these materials in primitive meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites, we see pretty much the same relative abundances that we do in the solar photosphere. So basically we come away from that with the realization that the planets are basically things that never made it into the sun while the sun was forming. It's stuff that was left over um, and it was pretty well mixed. Right. Um, well, when it comes together, it forms. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to this picture. When when you get all the material together from that process of accretion, um, there's a lot of heat and thermal energy there. It, it, it's associated with the impacts of accretion, but it's also associated with the decay of short-lived radionuclides. Okay, this formation process of a new star tends to happen shortly after a lot of that material formed, presumably, um, in the shock waves of supernova. And that's when you get a lot of short-lived radionuclides. And that stuff decays very quickly. It's incorporated into the interior of the material into these planets and, and produces a lot of heat as it decays, right? So in the early history of the solar system, we anticipate uh, you know, a vision of bubbling uh, interiors with a lot of convection taking place and a lot of heat and you know volcanism at the surface and so forth. And uh, we also have this differentiation process that occurs. All the heavy elements sink to the core. And so you have an iron nickel core and we call these siderophile elements. And when they do that, they leave behind the materials that don't make it into the core that we call the calcophile and the lithophile and the apophile elements. Lithophiles are at the crust, calcophiles are in the mantle, apophiles are volatiles, you know, if there is an atmosphere, we call those apophiles. Okay, so you got your siderophiles in the interior, iron-loving elements, but how, how big is that core exactly? Well, in the case of the Earth, we seem to know this very well. Now, previous missions, 
have focused on the surface of Mars, either from orbit or roving missions or landers. Uh, we're looking at the surface materials because that's all we can see. We have to get inside that to answer these kinds of geophysical questions. And the way we do that is with seismology. And when we do that, we can take what we learn and extrapolate it to other star formation scenarios, okay? So all these exoplanets that we're now discovering, um, the information that is acquired from this little insight lander with its seismometer, and we're gonna talk about the instruments here shortly, that information we can extrapolate to pretty much throughout the galaxy, really. Um, and that's not that much of a stretch. It's actually kind of a way to calibrate our models for planetary formation. So that's the kind of thing we're going to be thinking about when we take a look at this lander, uh, not just Mars. OK, so again, we know more about uh, the Earth and the moon uh, than we do about Mars because we have seismometers all over the Earth and we've been monitoring uh, the seismicity of the Earth for the last hundred years or more. For the moon, the Apollo seismometers that were deployed measured um, a, 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 some significant uh, moon quakes that gave us an insight into its structural interior. And then of course we had the Apollo samples that were returned and those can be examined isotopically in the laboratory and used to confirm a lot of theories about the interior of the moon, okay, based on geochemical evidence. So, you know, in the case of the earth, we have this warm liquid outer core um, that is generating a magnetic field for planet earth that we're very familiar with. And good thing too, because that's protecting us from, you know, solar radiation particles. Uh, not so much for the moon, the moon is cold and dead. Uh, its interior core has solidified, and so you don't get that dynamo effect and you don't get a magnetic field for the moon. What we have for the moon is residual magnetism in the surface rocks, but not like a magnetosphere around the body. Okay, and then the Earth, of course, is also active with its volcanoes and earthquakes and plate tectonics, which again, we don't see in the moon case. The, the lunar case has a single plate situation, not multiple plates. Well, Mars is in between um, in terms of its mass and size, almost exactly. Um, so it's big enough to have experienced an active history early in its history, but it's probably small enough to have lost a lot of that heat. Uh, it's got, you know, it's, it's higher surface area to volume ratio that allows it to lose heat more rapidly than, than the larger Earth. Okay, so the question is, is it still molten in its interior or has it frozen out? Now it's also a one plate planet. So we're not expecting any plate tectonics here. So we don't look to plate tectonics for a source of seismic energy, you know, earthquakes or Mars quakes in this case. Uh, we're thinking of quakes coming from uh, different types of interior processes. And we'll talk about those briefly. Okay, and this is just a little graphic to show you once again, the relative uh, sizes of the three bodies here that we're talking about. Okay, and a lot of these images are, are from packages um, that have been prepared at JPL uh, for public presentations. And then I've augmented them a little bit with my own thoughts here. So again, we have these question marks in the case of Mars for where the mantle stops and the core begins, what constitutes the upper mantle versus the lower mantle, how large is the core, et cetera. And those are the kinds of questions that can be answered only with seismology. Okay, so the instrument package is designed to address the vital, what we're calling the vital signs of, of Mars, its structure, its temperature, its thermal environment, uh, and its reflexes, its rotation and wobble. Okay, and I'll show you with the instrumentation how this ingenious little spacecraft is designed to do this. 
a little bit of redundancy here, the size of the core and its state, liquid, solid, or multi-phase is what we're trying to get at. The thickness and structure of the crust, the structure of the mantle and its composition, and exactly how warm this interior is and what that thermal gradient is, okay? Now, keep in mind that energy at the surface is coming from two sources. It's coming from the sun, your solar insulation on a daily basis. There's a diurnal cycle to that, and there's a seasonal cycle to that, just like on Earth. Uh, your second source of energy is this interior thermal energy, whether in the form of residual thermal energy left over from accretion or thermal energy that's produced in part by uh, radiogenic decay of, of long-lived radionuclides. We still have some of those that are decaying and producing heat, and that builds up in the interior and slowly leaks out to the surface. So there's a thermal gradient here that we can anticipate. And we want to get away from the solar energy to measure that. We certainly, you know, diurnal heating and seasonal heating is noise here. We have to get underneath the surface at least a few meters to get rid of that noise. And I'll show you how we're planning on doing that or how we planned on doing that. Okay, so these are the kinds of measurements that InSight is designed to do. How powerful. In other words, the magnitude and how frequent are the Mars quakes and where are they located within the structure of the planet? Okay, there's a box we want to check there. How does Mars react to meteoroid impacts? Because we know those occur. We've been seeing those occur from orbit over the last 15 years or so uh, with high resolution cameras, you know, basketball sized impactors. And they create quite a splash. You're going to see a figure of one of those here shortly. And how the surface of Mars flexes as the moon Phobos passes over. Believe it or not, that's something we can measure. We want to be able to determine the spin rate and the wobble of Mars to get uh, the moment of inertia for the planet. And the best way to get a sense for what that involves is uh, think of a hard boiled egg and think of a raw egg. And if you spin the two, you get completely different results, okay? That has to do with the moment of inertia of, of the body. And it tells you, just spinning an egg tells you right away something about its interior. And we can do that in a very sophisticated way uh, with Mars if we know exactly what the spin rate is, okay? The temperature profile with depth and the thermal properties of the ground. It's another thing we want to measure. Okay, and of course, each of these measurements feeds into more than one of the other science goals. They cross over. Okay, so what about the instruments? What are we gonna use to get at these measurements? Something called SICE, which is the seismometer. Something called RISE, which measures the spin rate and the wobble, and a heat flow and physical properties package, which we call HP cubed or HP3. And that is the thermal measurement device. So let's start taking a look at these instruments. Here's where they're all located. And we're going to sort of go through these um, one at a time here and get a sense for what they do. Starting with the SICE instrument. Okay, this is um, designed by the French space agency, CNES, with help from the Paris Institute of Earth Physics, IPGP. So um, it's basically a French instrument. It was supposed to fly originally in 2016, and uh, we had a problem with it that caused us to miss our launch window, and we had to bump it two years, of course, to the next launch window of 2018. Uh, but by then, everything was repaired and working, working extremely well. Uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and the Max Planck Institute of Solar System Research also assisted, as did uh, JPL. Uh, it's a truly international mission. And we've been working with uh, teams from uh, Spain and from Germany, uh, from France and from Switzerland 
uh, throughout the mission. So this is the size instrument. It's actually six seismometers. There's uh, three of these short period seismometers. And then there's three of these VBB, very broad baseline uh, seismometers, and they're all nestled in this sphere, okay? And <laughs> it's so sensitive, the VBBs, that they can measure displacement smaller than half a hydrogen atom diameter, okay? So with that kind of sensitivity, uh, you can see why uh, the tidal forces of Phobos would get picked up. Um, but in addition to that, when um, uh, atmospheric pressure waves move across the planet from surface convection or, or other, other causes, those can also get picked up um, and they can actually get measured in the tilt of, of this little seismometer. Uh, as they move across the lander, they, they press down on the surface and, and lift up again. And there's a tilt that occurs that you can actually sense with something this, this delicate, okay? And because it's so sensitive, uh, we had this wind and thermal shield prepared that gets lowered on top of it. Now, let me give you a little background here. Remember I said that we tried a seismometer in 1976 with the Viking landers. Um, what wasn't known at the time was that the winds of Mars were strong enough to create noise for the seismometer. And the seismometers were designed for Viking to just sit on the deck of the spacecraft, the lander. So both Vikings landed successfully in 1976. They turned on the seismometers and we could measure nothing but noise from the wind. Okay, so it was understood in 1976 that, you know, geez, if we're ever going to get these measurements for very basic geophysical calculations, next time we go, we're going to have to put the seismometer on the surface somehow. We're going to have to deploy it. And we'll probably end up having to cover it up to protect it from the wind. So that's what we did. It took 40 years, but that's what uh, Insight is all about mainly this seismometer and putting the wind and thermal shield on it provides the protection we needed to get the kind of measurements that we've always wanted. So what are the causes of seismic energy on Mars? Well, we said that we don't have plates on Mars. It's not a, a tectonically active planet. There was some uh, graben formation early in its history that was you know, of a tectonic nature. Um, so that's, that's a cause of some faulting that occurs, but it's associated with magma chambers, large magma chambers uh, that one can visualize as slowly cooling up. And as they cool, of course, they shrink. And the shrinkage uh, causes adjustments in the crust that result in faulting. And the fault is a little bit of a jolt um, that's creating a, a seismic wave. And, and that's what you know, we're expecting to measure here with size. And this is a, a seismic um, a moment uh, chart giving the number of quakes estimated. This is an estimated chart uh, per year. And here we talked about Phobos tides and we talked about atmospheric excitation, you know, moving across the surface. And this is a model. Uh, and we talked about meteoroid impacts. And here's an example uh, taken with the high rise camera, which we'll talk about a little bit more here if there's time, of like say a basketball sized impactor hitting the surface and wafting away some of the dust that's everywhere on the surface of Mars. And so you can see a spectacular splash on the surface, on the crust from this little basketball sized impactor. Okay, so we should be able to detect that. Um, with the sensitivities that I talked about, you can imagine something like that producing a, 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 a significant enough ripple in the subsurface for us to measure it. We'll talk about whether or not that has happened here uh, near the end of the presentation. Okay, I'm just gonna give you this little video. Hopefully it's not too jittery, uh, but even if it is, I think it'll communicate. This will show you how waves propagate 
throughout the interior of a planetary body. And you can see that they refract as they encounter the different transition zones from uh, upper mantle to lower mantle and lower mantle to core and so forth. And so this is how we get a window into the interior of a planet and it has to be done with size, uh, seismometers. But you can also see from this demonstration why, you know, and some of you might've been wondering, well, don't we need triangulation from several different uh, seismometers in order to get the kind of information we're looking for? Yes and no. Um, uh, one certainly prefers to have multi stations to get that resolution. Um, but as, as one of my colleagues says, one is infinitely greater than zero. And with a single seismic station, if you have a seismic event that's large enough, it will actually propagate all the way around the planet and come back to your measuring station. So you can get more than one measurement from the same event. And if you get that, then the timing of that propagation and, and all the wave physics that goes into it is going to tell you a lot just from a single location. All right. Okay, so the next instruments, the rise antennas, those are these little horn shaped uh, uh, booms that you see here. And of course, like say, we're measuring the reflexes with rise, we're measuring the wobble and the rotation, and it's giving us location information on the surface of Mars to within a few centimeters. And this you sort of get for free uh, as you do your X-band communication. Um, you just want to target that communication window so that you're getting the angle that you want either um, shortly after sun rot or earth rise or before earth set in the sky of Mars uh, when you do your X-band uh, pass, as it's called, we call it a pass in, in uh, the lingo of, of the deep space network. So like say, you're getting that information for free as long as you have your, your rise antennas on at the time. Okay, and that rise is gonna tell us like say if it's a soft boiled egg or a hard boiled egg, and it's gonna tell us something about the core of the planet in addition to the seismic data. Okay, the heat flow and physical properties package, HP3, takes Mars temperature, but like I said, only if you can penetrate the upper surface of the planet. Now we had uh, prepared this uh, probe to go down five meters, okay, with a tether. And on the tether are these thermocouples, these, these heat sensors at specific intervals. And so you can get multiple measurements along the tether that will give you that thermal gradient in addition to measuring the direct temperature from Mars interior. And this probe also has the ability to turn on heaters of its own and put out a thermal pulse into the interior, which can then be measured. We can measure the decay rate of that thermal pulse and that gives us something uh, on the thermal conductivity of the layers it's penetrating, okay? So the uh, probe is designed to work like this. It's a percussion hammer probe. And it takes three seconds to make a hammer stroke. We've done many tens of thousands of hammer strokes. And spoiler alert, I'll just tell you, uh, we didn't make it more than about 31 or so centimeters. Uh, actually, I think we went the entire length of the probe, um, but we weren't able to get any, any farther. And it wasn't for lack of trying. We've been trying to make this probe work for a great many, many months, a couple of years uh, of the prime, throughout the prime mission, basically. And the original intent was to hammer down let it sit, take a measurement, hammer down, let it sit, and so forth in a stair-step fashion over time until we got it to depth. Uh, like say a total depth of five meters was the uh, desired depth, but I think three meters would have still sufficed if we could have made that depth to get the measurements that we wanted to. But unfortunately, it's very, very drill difficult to drill on another planet. 
And as you heard from Dave in the introduction, I used to do a fair amount of uh, uh, field work to hydrogeologists, and I spent a lot of time behind a drill rig. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that problems always crop up and you always need to be in the field at the time to troubleshoot those problems. So doing something like this on another planet from a distance remotely um, you know, is, is very, very challenging. And what was supposed to happen is that, and I've got a little movie here to show this and I'll talk while it's playing. It's supposed to penetrate based on its um, friction with its surroundings. So here's a test and it's a, um, a time lapse. And the test worked just fine. Uh, to its entire penetration depth of five meters. And this works, we're now understanding, because the soil particles that we're hammering through um, have a small amount of adhesion with the surface of the probe. And it probably has a lot to do with atmospheric moisture. Okay, and on Mars, that's so dry that what happens is um, the soil particles don't adhere quite as readily. And also there's something called a dura crust on the surface of Mars that's sort of um, helps uh, cement the particles together slightly over hundreds of millions of years at the place where we landed. And that means that when we try to hammer through it, the probe just kind of makes a hole, uh, but then it kind of rattles around in the hole. And in fact, there were a couple of times when it bounced out of the hole. Um, so we had to come back and try to hold it down with our, um, with our arm. And I'll show you uh, some images here shortly. So again, we wanted to get below this, um, the effects of the uh, sun here, what we're calling the skin depth to get down to the thermal gradient and it just didn't happen. But here's another picture of the thermal sensors in the a tether. You can see how those are located there. Um, and we also have a way of measuring the tilt in this probe um, because we can't see what's happening below the surface. We have to infer it uh, based on the tilt and how far the tether penetrated the ground and we measure that with these little um, um, uh, patterns on, on the tether itself. It's actually very similar to the way we do things on Earth behind a drill rig. You have to infer things because you can't see what's going on. And there are a couple of cameras on the lander as well. There's this IDC, the instrument deployment camera. It's affixed to the arm. And the instrument contacts camera, the ICC, which never moves. It's just looking down in the same direction, but it has a fish eye lens, so we get a pretty wide angle image of things. Okay, and this is the size of the lander. You can see it to scale here uh, at uh, Lockheed Martin, where it was assembled before launch. This is the actual lander. Okay, and here's a little, oh, let me turn off this music. Uh, here's a little um, video that shows you how the instruments got deployed to the surface using this arm. Uh, now, if the lander looks familiar to you, you may be remembering the Phoenix mission because it's basically the sister spacecraft to uh, the Phoenix uh, spacecraft, which landed, um, I think, 78 degrees north uh, to look for frozen water uh, on the surface of Mars or just below the surface. And for that mission, there was an arm just like this one. In fact, the InSight arm is a flight spare from the Phoenix mission. And it has a little scoop on it um, that was used for Phoenix to scrape away at the surface, which for Phoenix had the, the, the hardness and consistency of a sidewalk uh, at those temperatures. Um, but this is how it worked for InSight. And we're still using the arm, even though we've completed the deployment of the instruments, we're still using the arm to do a bunch of other things. Right now we're trying to bury the tether with uh, soil um, in order to improve um, uh, the uh, thermal sensitivity of the situation. 
Okay, so here we've deployed the SICE instrument. We've deployed the wind and thermal shield. And here now we're deploying in the video, the HP3 housing, and that contains the probe. Okay, and this is uh, the 70 meter antenna of the um, Goldstone location of the Deep Space Network. We also have antennas um, located in Canberra, Australia, and in Madrid, Spain. And if you're familiar with the way this works, you've got these three uh, systems of communication antennas that are, are separated by roughly 120 degrees across the Earth. So that no matter what the orientation of the Earth at the time, uh, and a signal comes in, uh, somebody is there to receive it. Okay, and this is the, the mission timeline, building of the spacecraft that we launched in May of 2018. We cruised until November 26, and then we entered the atmosphere at full speed. We carried along with us uh, a little chip that has 2.4 million names on it. You may have been involved in that and your name might be sitting there on the surface of Mars right now together with the names of my two children. And I'm just showing you this picture. This is Toulouse, France. Um, so one of the neat things about an international mission is that if you work on the science operation side of things, uh, you get uh, to travel to Europe several times and I got to make four separate trips there. Uh, a couple of the trips were to Toulouse, where the um, where CNES is located, the French Space Agency, and this is where we conducted a number of our initial uh, uh, science team uh, tool uh, test activities to make sure that everything was going to work okay. Working with uh, the CNES people was really, really a joy. All right, and in here is the. Um, the InSight uh, rocket. And it was a very, very foggy uh, eve uh, morning. This was a night launch in the wee hours of the morning. And so we never actually got to see the launch. We were there. This was uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, the first launch of a planetary mission from the West Coast um, in history. Uh, but we didn't get to see it because of all the fog. It was a marine layer that, it, that came in but we could hear it and we could feel it. Uh, then, well, of course, once it was above the fog, this picture was taken from Mount Wilson uh, by somebody who did a, a multiple time exposure, very wonderful picture. You can see the star trails here, letting you know approximately how long uh, the exposure took. Um, and people in Los Angeles could see this with the naked eye flying overhead on its way to Mars. And just uh, in case uh, some of you aren't uh, familiar, although I assume uh, all of you are, uh, this is the geometry uh, during launch uh, where the Earth is the blue circle and, and, and uh, red is the Mars ellipse. Uh, we have to launch at just the right time so that we can simply push the spacecraft out to a farther orbit in a way that allows it to encounter Mars at the right time. And again, if we miss that opportunity, that launch window, we have to wait approximately 26 months, I think it is, depending on, on the, uh, the op opposition. Okay, uh, it took about six months to cruise to Mars. And uh, because I worked on landing site selection for the InSight spacecraft and the Mars 2020 rover, I thought I would just go over a couple of discussion points of what's involved in that, because it doesn't get talked about very much uh, but before I do, where, are there any questions? Let me just pause here for a second. Are there so any plans? What was the launch, was the launch uh, vehicle that was used to drill, circular drill to Mars? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, somebody asked what the launch vehicle was. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think I, you're catching me oh, off guard. I think it was an Atlas V rocket, wasn't it? I am actually going to look that up to make sure I don't make a mistake. I think it was an Atlas V. Yeah, Atlas V. Atlas V. According okay. to Wikipedia, anyway. Yeah, and that's where I'm looking too, because they have, they do such a great job of compiling the information. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, Atlas V rocket. 
And the second question was uh, about drilling, I think. Is there, is anybody planning to send a drill, not, not pound it down, but drill down like we do with oil wells? Well, like um, not, not at present. Um, it has been discussed, of course, but the problem with drilling and the problem with hammering, one of the additional problems not related to cohesion of the soil, the problem is for drilling, you really need down pressure. Um, and you don't have down pressure if your rig, in addition to having lower gravity of the Martian environment, you, if your rig is a small mass rig, which it's necessarily going to have to be uh, just because of the cost constraints involved, unless you know Elon Musk decided to pull out the stops and send some big rig to Mars, you're not going to have a lot of down pressure. So I'm very skeptical about drilling. Uh, and I'm also skeptical that even if we could, we would find anything like potable water because it's going to be frozen. Uh, unless we can get to a place where the thermal gradient produces a melting of that material, it's just going to be really difficult to get water out of the ground um, the way a lot of people are, are thinking. It, 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 it's not impossible, perhaps, but I'm, I'm dubious about the success of that enterprise until we can get a great deal of hardware and infrastructure in place. Um, and how do you do that if you don't have a lot of potable water? I don't know. One of the problems with sending humans to Mars obviously is water, but another one's gonna be dust. Uh, it's, it's just not a hospitable place. <laughs> so anyway, that's a topic for another discussion, but a very good question. Uh, okay, so let me just move on. Uh, a couple slides to show here. Um, getting to the Martian surface is, is, is difficult because you're moving at top, top speeds. You're moving at many thousands of miles per hour when you hit that upper atmosphere. And you've got to slow yourself down to a complete stop. Um, how you're gonna, how you're gonna do that? And also, where are you going to land? Well, you have engineering requirements that govern your choice for where to land. And obviously that's critical because if you can't land the spacecraft, you don't have a mission. So the kinds of things we look for are slopes that are too steep and rocks that are too large and in too high of an abundance. So these are the steps to getting to the surface. You hit the upper atmosphere, like I say, at full speed, you deploy a parachute, that slows you down, pardon the way. Uh, you need a heat shield to protect you from the friction of that entry. Uh, but then once you're slowed down a little bit, you can drop that heat shield away and turn on a radar and then drop away from the back shell and turn on some thrusters, all right? And that gets you all the way down to the surface. But this is what we call seven minutes of terror because it's all done automatically. And the whole time that's happening, anyone and everyone who worked on the mission is sitting there thinking, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? And obviously a lot could go wrong with this. Everything has to go right or it, it's not going to survive. And wow, it, it worked. We got there. We deployed uh, the solar arrays and we're still operating here uh, more than two years later. And we just got um, our extended mission funding for additional two years. Uh, let's see. So these are the just a uh, quick visualization of the kinds of hazards. You know, we're talking about slopes. If they're too steep, obviously you could tip over. That's no good. If there's a big rock there, you could land on top of it. Uh, that's no good. Or you could land with one leg on it. That's no good. It could tip you over. Or let's say you land on a nice flat surface. Everything is fine. But then you try to deploy your all, you know, your, your badly needed solar array and you bump into a big rock that you just happen to land next to. That's no good. Now, we happen to land in a beautiful spot, as you'll see in a minute. But I wanted to talk a little bit about orbital reconnaissance because there's a history here. The first time we landed on Mars with the Viking spacecraft in 76, we didn't have much of anything to help us get to the surface. It was kind of blind luck. Low resolution images and redundancy, the idea of sending two spacecraft was our way of, of safeguarding it, uh, our, our mission and science priority and objectives. Um, the idea was, you know, redundancy, you send two spacecraft and hope that one of them works. Well, in our case, we got lucky and both of them worked. But since that time, uh, look at the dates up here, 76 for Viking, 97 for Pathfinder, 
MER was 2004, the Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit and Opportunity. And then the Mars Science Laboratory was 2012. And most recently, oh, this is MSL, it should say uh, Mars 2020. Okay, so these are the, the, the data sets that we had here in rainbow colors. So in Viking days, all we had was Viking orbiter images. We also had these orbiters that were collecting pictures for us that we could then use to make a impromptu almost landing site selection on the fly. Uh, that's what we did and that's all we had. But in 1997, we had the Viking data and we had some Earth-based radar data from Arecibo um, and then surface information from the Viking landing sites themselves. By the time we went again with Spirit and Opportunity, we then had several orbiters in place with their own cameras that assisted that process and augmented our, our database. Um, but then by 2012, we had this high-rise camera. Now, this is the high-rise camera. It flew on uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's still operating. It's still taking pictures. And the resolution on these is insane. Uh, you can see things down to 25 centimeters per pixel in the best of the images. OK, so here's just a, a few examples. This is a Martian dust devil. Uh, going straight up from the surface almost toward the camera, and you can see its shadow here. Uh, we talked about impactors and what those look like. Here's another example. Um, there are over a thousand of these that we have recorded on the surface of Mars that have occurred within the last 15 years or so. We can see them from orbit. We can see dunes and ripples, and we can even turn the camera on Phobos and get high resolution images of the satellites of the planet. Uh, look at this, here's a landslide in the act of occurrence down the slope that the high-rise camera happened to catch. Um, so these are the spectacular images that you wanna make computer wallpaper out of. But in addition to this, of course, we can look at a landing site that we want to go to and it's less spectacular, but the same images are going to help us map that surface. You can get different terrain types here by looking at the surface carefully. And that's what geologists do. And that's what I did to assist with the per, uh, preparation of this terrain surface map. And you can see these are all landing ellipses uh, for the InSight mission. You start with a large number of them and then you pare it down over time. Now the original list has to meet certain engineering criteria having to do with uh, atmospheric uh, thickness and so forth, because you need some atmosphere to deploy a parachute. You can't do that at the top of Olympus Mons because the summit of Olympus Mons is in space. There's no atmosphere up there. The atmosphere of Mars is very thin, only about six millibars at the surface, only about 1% of what you feel in, in the room you're sitting in. So even, you know, even at high speed, um, the atmosphere is thin. Now it's thick enough at those speeds that you still need a parachute to slow you down, but it's not gonna get you all the way to the surface. But you want as much atmosphere as you can get. So that's one of your engineering constraints, OK? And then you, you come up to your list, and you pare it down. And over time, you get down to, I think we had four ellipses, four main ones. And these slight variations in the orientation of the ellipse have to do with whether or not you launch at the beginning of your, your uh, launch window or the end of your launch window. It changes slightly the orientation of the ellipse. I think it's about seven degrees change, depending. Um, but then once you, once you get a pretty good handle on which ellipse you want to be your final ellipse, after you've taken a close look at the slopes and the rock abundance of everything in that ellipse, uh, and here's an example. This is actually from Mars 2020, but you can see the areas where the slopes are too great in this picture for a, a place we didn't land called um, Northeast Sirtis. The red blobs here are places where the slope is more than 25 degrees, I, I think. So you get a sense it's all done uh, at the engineering level. And then back to InSight here, we carpet bomb the ellipse with high rise frames. Now these high rise camera images I was telling you about, they're small, they're about a gigabyte each uh, to get that extremely high resolution, but they're only filling a small portion of this 120 kilometer long ellipse. So you really do have to carpet bomb over time, you got to target all these different portions of that ellipse to get a full mosaic 
that it can then be used to calculate the slopes across the entire ellipse, because after all, you don't know, you know exactly where you're going to land in here. You have to make sure you've looked at it all. And you know, green is zero slope, perfectly flat. Um, red is high slope, 20 degrees. You only see the high slopes really on the rims of craters here. If you look carefully, you can see them. They're there, but they're only on the rims of craters where you have a high, high angle slope. So look at this. This is a pretty flat place we picked to land insight. And we, that's OK, because all we need is a place to land where we can get our seismic and thermal measurements. OK, but the other thing is rocks. And you can see the rocks down to a certain diameter. You can see them in those high rise frames. And you can count them. So we actually did some human counting of these rocks. And we used that to calibrate a, um, an automatic uh, script that would model um, the rock abundance based on shadows. After we calibrated it with human eyes, we could then use the script to identify shadows of a rock and then parse that out into um, components then useful for you know, calculating the rock density of the surface. So after that, all you do is you take your high rise frame, you feed it into the model and run, let it run and it will calculate the locations and abundances of all the different rocks and their sizes, which we can then plot and use to assess the uh, landing site safety of, of the ellipse. And so here's a rock abundance. One is, uh, or blue is very low rock abundance, red is very high. And again, the red is associated with these craters. So this is about as best, you know, the best we could do um, you, you get it down to a probability of success in the, I think in the 92% or 95% range, and then you fly. And um, we actually were so successful that when we landed, we had a perfectly flat surface and almost no rocks. I think the largest rock in the work volume where we wanted to deploy the instruments was uh, 0.8 centimeters or something like that. So a uh, very successful landing. Uh, and I got to work with uh, Matt Gollenbeck uh, on that. Matt Gollenbeck, who was the project scientist for the Mars Pathfinder mission and has worked on every landing site selection process uh, for JPL since then. So uh, in addition to the InSight lander, there were also these small uh, CubeSat uh, spacecraft that flew along with us and they were relays. Uh, they were a technology demonstration that worked very, very well. They were also relays that allowed us to collect uh, real-time da data as the spacecraft entered the atmosphere, went through its entry, descent, and landing process, and made it to the surface. These did not land. They just flew past the planet, both of them, with the spacecraft kind of between them on its way down, and then they just relayed. So we landed at Elysium Planitia, which is right here on Mars on November 26, 2018. And this is what the landing site looks like. Kind of boring, not much to see, but perfect for a seismometer and a little weather station. Now, we also have, like say, uh, in addition to RISE and the heat probe, um, we have a pressure sensor, a magnetometer, and a uh, a wind velocity sensor. And addition, originally, those were designed to augment the seismic data because, like, say, if you have some weather related phenomena in the atmosphere occurring, uh, those can be picked up by the seismometer. But uh, just sort of incidentally, they also serve as a nice little weather station. So we're getting a lot of weather science from the surface. And this is a selfie uh, taken by the camera the IDC, the instrument deployment camera on the arm. And here's an animated GIF, uh, GIF just showing you the uh, deployment, part of the deployment process of the seismometer itself. Done with this grapple and the arm. And here we have another GIF showing some uh, clouds after the wind and thermal shield was deployed. And, um, you know, just to confirm the rationale behind all of this, uh, the seismometers were turned on while the seismometer was sitting on the deck and measured um, the environment. 
and we got a lot of noise, just like with Viking. Then the seismometer was deployed to the surface and turned on again, and the noise was significantly reduced, but there was still some noise. Then the wind and thermal shield was put on top of this, and the seismometers were turned on again, and all the noise went away, almost all of it. In fact, the seismometer, I told you, is sensitive enough to measure displacements on the order of half the diameter of a hydrogen atom. That was the predicted sensitivity. The actual sensitivity is actually better. So uh, the what the seismometer is sensing is very quiet with respect to the winds of that environment. And it's extremely sensitive to the subsurface, which is exactly what we wanted. Now, speaking of um, winds, uh, I can play this audio if you'd like to hear it. This is the sound that we picked up. You won't hear anything right away. This little video is a little dated because uh, we had not yet deployed the instruments when it was created. Okay, and here are some of the pictures from the instrument deployment camera of the mole. Uh, like say, we, we, we got down pretty much the full uh, length of the instrument, which is, I think about 31 centimeters or so. Um, and it was jumping back out of the hole when we tried to do some hammering. So we had to position the scoop on top of it uh, very carefully to try to hold it in place and encourage it to continue down the way it's supposed to. And you can see it's at a pretty significant angle too. Um, so it's, it, was a, it was a nice try. We gave it our best shot. Everybody, the team that I work with, it's just an amazing group of people. Um, and it, it didn't work, but uh, we're not discouraged because the probe can still measure thermal conductivity of the, uh, the soil that it's in, and we can still collect uh, useful science data from that. Oh, I guess I just threw this picture here. Um, this was where I was in Nice, France uh, for a science team meeting when, when the pandemic hit. Uh, just kind of an anecdote here. Um, when Italy had shut its borders, and I think the hills in the distance are Italian hills, we're right on the close to the edge of uh, the Italian border here in this part of the French Riviera. Um, and they had closed their borders, and then France shut down the Louvre, and um, they canceled the Carnival uh, parades that were taking place there in Nice. And so things were starting to happen. Um, and we got out of there sort of just in time. I remember when I got on my flight, there were 57 cases in France. And when I stepped off the airplane, it had gone up to 100. Oh, no. Yeah. So now what are we dealing with? Well, we, we've been active um, uh, for about 850 sols. On Mars, we call a day a sol. Uh, and over that time, we've had dust slowly accumulating on the solar arrays. 
And with a solar powered spacecraft, of course, that's not, that's not great news. We anticipate it, but we were hoping that we would see the kind of dust cleaning events that we saw on both Spirit and Opportunity. Um, I got to work on both of those rovers and we would periodically see a spike in our power because a dust devil or a fortunate wind gust would come along and clean the dust off. So we were sort of spoiled by that with myrrh and we were expecting to see that here. But to date uh, across this mission, we have not seen a single dust cleaning event. So the dust, there's always dust in the atmosphere and it just settles out very slowly over time and it creates a uh, lower and lower and lower uh, power availability for the science that we're trying to do. So I just saw an article on Yahoo that said we went into hibernation mode. Insight is in hibernation mode. That's not true. I don't know who got the, a hold of that. That's misinformation. We are not in a hibernation mode, uh, but we do have uh, power struggles uh, based on the ever-present uh, occurrence of dust accumulation here. And we anticipate that, um, but we're gonna try to continue to get as much science data as we can out of the mission. So where do we stand on the science right now? Here's a status update. I'm just gonna read through these bullet points. Uh, we've had howling winds since June and uh, they have been deafening the seismometers to low energy events. Um, we have, however, had nearly 500 small quakes below magnitude four. Apparent violation of scaling laws that apply on the Earth and the Moon. So one, one would have, before insight, one would have taken what we've learned about the Earth and about the Moon and tried to scale in between them to predict what we were gonna see on Mars. And uh, we don't see the number of large quakes that we were expecting. So, uh, you know, the scaling is where 100 magnitude three events correspond to 10 magnitude four events, et cetera. So quakes at 3.7 and 3.3 have been traced to the Cerebus Fosse region at 1600 kilometers east of the landing site. We measured both pressure and shear waves from those events. Uh, now, we've also measured other quakes at a greater distance, approximately 4,000 kilometers, and they indicate a cool mantle. So no large Mars quakes, okay? The crust is surprisingly thin. It's only 20 or 37 kilometers thick. The RISE instrument has tracked for over 350 hours and indicated a large radius for the iron core over half the planet's diameter, and it's still molten. Uh, there have been no measured unambiguous meteoroid events, which is a real surprise. And we think part of the reason for that might have to do with the, um, the busted up nature of the surface materials, what we call the regolith on Mars. Uh, wave propagation through that material might be just so poor that um, unless the uh, impact occurs close to the spacecraft, we just can't pick it up. Uh, the mole penetration uh, was challenged and we have since abandoned um, uh, efforts to try to get that to work. Uh, so we are anticipating quieter winds as we re-enter the calm period of measurement. And this is where I'm going to pause for questions. Um, like I say, I do have some additional information about the Mars 2020 mission. If people wanted to stick around and listen to that, I'm more than happy to share it. Okay. Um, Jim, yeah, if you wanted to open up the chat window, we've got a few questions in that um, list there. And while you're opening the chat window, Jim, uh, tell our friends about your work schedule during some of these missions you had to uh, schedule your workday around Mars sols, which are, I think, about 47 minutes longer than an Earth day. Yeah, um, it's been a while since I've been on Mars time. The, the Mars 2020 team is currently on Mars time. Um, but yes, I was on Mars time during the, what are called operational readiness tests, the ORTs of the InSight mission. And, um, 
that was a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, you show, to work, show up to work in the middle of the night or early morning hours. And uh, I'm glad that didn't go on for too long because um, it, it can become nerve wracking after a while for those who have to put up with it. And, you know, for Mars 2020, I think it's a 90, 90 Sol uh, Mars time equivalent that they're um, living through. Um, at least that's what I was told when I submitted my proposal to work on that mission. Uh, there were a hundred and what, 119 proposals submitted and I think only 10 of them were selected. So I, I'm, I'm waiting to reapply to participate on that mission. But uh, yeah, I wasn't looking forward to working on Mars time. So part of me is relieved that I, it wasn't selected. <laughs> Thank you. Let, let's see uh, the chat window questions here. Uh, let me start at the top. Uh, let's see. Uh, would the digging mechanism work better in another location or is it just flawed or how Mars soil is? Uh, that is a great, a great question, John. Um, I, and I, I have to say, we don't know the answer to that one. Uh, based on our assumption that it has to do with the availability of soil moisture combined with a dura crust environment, um, my guess is that there may be better locations that uh, may, while, while not having better soil moisture might have less dura crust. Um, so at this point, I would say your guess is as good as mine and mine and maybe we should try it again uh, at some point now that we have the technology, you know, we, it, it's easier to do something twice than it is to do it the first time. So uh, let's see, next question. Perseverance was able to read the terrain to choose a landing site. Did Insight have any uh, such? Yes, um, those are the images that I can. Oh, you're talking about terrain relative mm -hmm. navigation. Yes, mm -hmm. I have a movie to show you shortly. Let me get through the rest of these uh, and then we'll play that movie. Please uh, do. Uh, specific to terrain relative navigation, TRN. Uh, is there an electrostatic property of the dust that makes it hard for winds to clear it off? Excellent question. And for a long time, um, the assumption was that yes, the, the, prop, the dust particles have electrostatic properties that make them cling to things. But I'll tell you, we've seen that dust um, cascade off of sloped surfaces in a way that tells me it very readily leaves a surface. Um, it may, there may be a residual thin layer behind, but it's optically thin. And part of my PhD at work was actually to look at uh, dust in the thermal infrared on the surfaces of meteorites. And I've got a paper that I'm still trying to get out the door on this subject. Um, but it, it needed to be brushed off of a surface on MER with the brush tool, but um, it could be extremely thin. And there are certainly examples of materials on Mars uh, that show almost completely dust-free surfaces and so I'm thinking the electrostatic adhesion, at least to metal surfaces, when you get to electrostatics and electrochemistry, it sure makes a difference whether you're talking about conductors or non-conductors, how well something sticks to it. Uh, so, but at least in the case of, um, of conductors, it, it doesn't seem to stick very strongly. I would, I would argue that point uh, with, with any colleague who wants to. Um, Let's see, do we need more insight like landers to continue the science or other types of missions? Yeah, probably. Um, oh, I skipped a question, my apologies. What does a Mars sunset, sunset look like? Uh, there are examples of Mars sunsets that you can look for if you Google that, I think you would probably get to see some. Make sure that they're color corrected so that you get the proper color tones. Uh, but we do have a number that we've collected over the years with several missions. So those should pop up for you. Um, more insight landers to continue the science. Well, now that we have some uh, epicenters for uh, earthquakes or Mars quakes, um, it seems to me we could maybe target those areas as long as they meet the safety requirements that the engineers tell us that we need to have. Um, for an insight specific mission, we sort of ended up landing in the only place that we could on the surface of Mars. You would think there'd be a lot of places 
Um, but once we started looking closely at what was needed to get this particular mission to work, Elysium Planitia was sort of the only place it would work. <clears throat> Um, and that's why you see it at a longitude that's close to that for the Curiosity rover. We would not have preferred that because we have to compete with them for communication um, as the orbiters go in their polar orbits up over the landing site. For both of those spacecraft, they, you know, we have to compete uh, to get the, the, uh, the passes that we want, the comm passes. Um, uh, so we would prefer to have those separate a little bit, but because of the, the constraints involved for landing safely uh, to do the kind of science we wanted to do, we had to land the Elysium Planitia. So if we do go back with another seismometer to do this kind of work, we would have to um, probably make a slightly different design with different specifications. Let's see, uh, since Mars has a thin atmosphere, have you thought about putting a fan or some sort of arm to blow off the solar panels? That gets raised a lot, that question. In fact, I would say that's the most frequent question I get asked. Um, you know, somebody else, else I, I was talking to suggested that we, in the future, find a way to tilt them. And that combined with what I was telling you about the electrostatic properties could very well encourage the sloughing of dust off the surfaces. Um, so either tilting ability uh, or some kind of brush system, uh, yes, I agree, should be considered in the future because it would sure make life easier if we could have our power levels back to where we would like to see them. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. so I think that's the last question. So if you'd like now, let me stop sharing screens for just a second. I'm going to switch over to the other um, set of slides that I have, and I'm going to pull up. Let me just start here. If how much? How are we? How are we for time? Do people want to hear some more? Eight thirty, but you know, I think we've still got uh, still have twenty six participants, so we're hanging with you. Okay, let me just go through these quickly then. I'm just showing you a couple of the landing ellipses for a couple of the other sites that did not get selected for the Mars 2020 rover. This is one called Southwest Mellis. It would have been awesome because it's right on the edge of uh, uh, the Vallis Marineris Canyon. <laughs> you can see part of it here in the southern half or quadrant of the frame, uh, but the winds were too high here. So, you know, we had to disregard that one as a, as a safe landing site. Um, but this is another kind of hazard for a rover. We talked about slopes and we talked about rocks, but this is something called an inescapable hazard. You might land perfectly safely in this dune field, uh, but if you can't get out of there, you, do, you don't have much of a mission. So we had to map all of these kinds of places, inescapable hazards, and there's a lot of them on Mars. So um, those had to be... Um, those had to be levied against in making our landing site selection. This is the final map for Jezero Crater. This is an ancient lake, and this is the river delta that fed or accumulated in the lake as a river fed into it here. And so this, you know, Mars 2020 is not a geophysical mission. It's an astrobiological mission. We're hoping to find evidence of past life. Uh, left in the rocks as one or another kind of biosignature, some kind of chemical pattern that tells us that it could not have been an inorganic process. It must have been an organic process. And the way we decided we need to do that is by collecting samples and bringing them home. And we need two more missions to bring them home. I'm just gonna show those to you briefly here. In this architecture, so one uh, lander or rover lands and collects samples and caches them. Then you need another rover to come down and go over to get those and put them on the top of a Mars ascent vehicle, a MAV, a little rocket, stands about five or six feet high, that launches that little Martian um, container, this uh, Oz, so-called the orbital sampler, lofts that into orbit around Mars, and then a third spacecraft comes and collects the Oz while in orbit and returns it to Earth where it then gets dropped into the desert. So uh, sure there's you know, 32. Sure there, um, Jim, because we're, your audio presentation is wonderful, but uh, we're not seeing any graphics. Oh no, uh, let me see. 
Uh, let me see if I can fix that. Yeah, it's easy to forget when you don't see that little green border around it that, that is actually. Okay, here, let me, thank you for stopping me. There we go, yeah, because it's a neat... Okay, yeah. wow. All right, let's just go back up here really quickly, sorry. Uh, this was the first image I thought I was showing you of Southwest Mellis Landing Site. There's a the canyon, can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and the next uh, slide is showing you this inescapable hazard. You heard me talk about that. Here's an example of an inescapable hazard. And we learned this the hard way with the uh, spirit and opportunity. You know, spirit got caught in a sand drift and never got out of it. Opportunity got caught once, but we did get out of it. Uh, but we learned our lesson there and we decided, okay, never again. We're not gonna drive through these, uh, uh, we called them purgatory ripples at the time. <laughs> Um, and here's a, a map of another landing site called East Margarita Fur that had its own set of uh, inescapable hazards. And then this is the Jezero Crater landing site, okay? So this is where the crater is. The edge of the crater is here. Uh, the river is here. This is the river delta, and this is the landing ellipse. And I think we ended up landing right about here. And in the movie that I'm gonna show you, you can actually see the divert from terrain relative navigation, which I'm gonna show you a little movie for here too. Here's the architecture, uh, rover lands, collects the samples. Then you get another rover to land and fetch the samples, plop them on the top of a Mars Ascent vehicle. The sample sphere looks like this. The sample tubes are about the length of a cigar. That gets lofted into orbit around Mars. And then another uh, mission is sent as a retriever to rendezvous with the sample sphere and bring it back to Earth, Earth, where it then lands in the desert, probably Utah. So this is what we can anticipate in the future. And if anybody knows any young people who they think might be interested in this, this is going to take a while. By the time they're you know, in college or beyond, uh, we could be seeing these samples come home. So the, the two additional missions needed to bring these home have not yet been green lighted. We're we're expecting that once we collect the samples, that will not be an issue, um, but that is the situation at present. Okay, and here's the terrain relative navigation. You ready? We're gonna play this movie. It's a JPL film. We are in Death Valley testing terrain relative navigation, the new technology for March, 2020. The terrain in Death Valley is very much like Mars. It has a lot of sand dunes and steep slopes. It's quite similar to the landing site that Mars 2020 will be going to. We're taking a copy of the system that will be on the spacecraft and we're testing it in the way that it would be used during the flight mission. Terrain relative navigation gives the vehicle the ability to figure out where it is. This is kind of along the same lines of what the Apollo astronauts did uh, with people in the loop uh, back in the day. Those guys uh, were looking out the window and uh, looking for different craters and other features on the moon that they knew of from the maps we had of the moon. So that way they could figure out where they are and figure out where they needed to land to, to be safe. So for the first time here on Mars, we, we're, we're automating that. What terrain relative navigation gives you is the ability to avoid hazards that you already know about. So large hazards, hills, craters, things that you've seen before. With the camera, we take images as we're descending and we match pieces of the image to orbital imagery that we have stored on board. And if we make many of these matches, we're able to figure out where we are relative to the map. If we didn't have terrain relative navigation, the probability of landing safely at Jezero Crater is about 80 to 85%. But with Mars 2020, we can actually bring that probability of success of landing safely at Jezero Crater all the way up to 99% safe every single time. We don't have an astronaut that we can put on board Mars 2020, uh, but we can put this uh, this system, this terrain relative navigation system, so that the, the spacecraft could figure it out on its own. I could see it being used on lunar missions, science missions, as well as human missions. Future Mars missions, of course, Mars sample return, Europa lander, landing on a comet, um, pretty much everywhere you want to land, you're going to want to have terrain relative navigation. Okay, I hope that answers uh, one of the questions I just received. And then, sorry, um, 
uh, if there's time and if, in, if there's interest, uh, this is just that little bit of footage that shows the actual landing of Mars 2020. Uh, do we want to see this? Sure. All right. Here we go. Absolutely. You're starting to straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate indicate shoot the board. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 480 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second at an altitude of about 10 km, nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Net filter converge. Velocity solution, 3.3 meters per second. Altitude, 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 kilometers of the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the timing of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OPS okay, valid. We have confirmation that the land vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Timing. TBA is nominal. We have timing of the landing engines. Shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. Getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. We are starting to straighten up and fly right. Okay. I think that's probably the last uh, thing I wanted to share with you. So thank you very much. And I'm here for more questions if you have them. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Well done.